Okay, so let's quickly look at denominationalism. We're going to look at a denomination. And we're going to start with what a denomination is. We're going to look at the, the last chapter, which I have basically, you know, um, highlighted there. Or picked up. A denomination, in this sense, is created um, when part of a church no longer feel they can accept the leadership of that church as a spiritual leadership due to a different view of doctrine. I want to stop right there. So a denomination in this sense is created when a part of a church no longer feel they can accept the leadership of that church as a spiritual leadership due to a different view of doctrine. By doctrine we mean, you know, the body of teaching. Amen? So they do not agree with certain things in the teaching or in the doctrine which they are following and then they want to make some changes in the teachings. And so as a result of that, they basically break away or a certain group of people move away or divide themselves and start another church. Amen? And that's how a denomination is formed. Amen? So that's the idea of denomination over a denomination within you know the content the context of Christianity. Okay, now let's look at so now we know what a denomination is. A denomination is a is is is, is a church that was started because they broke away and started a different church with a different set of teachings. Mm -hmm. And so that's called a denomination. That's a, that's now a, a, a church a, that, that broke away. Do you see now? Mm -hmm. From a certain church. And so it started a denomination. It's called a denomination. So now we know what a denomination is. Mm -hmm. But now what we want to know is the, the idea of denominationalism. The terminology of it. In other words, the belief system. It's a belief system. So let's look at the belief of denominationalism, the, uh, this idea. Okay, denominationalism is the belief. This is now for anybody that believes like this, this is called denominationalism. This means you are part of denominationalism. Amen? It's when you believe this way. And that's what's being explained here. Denominationalism is the belief that some or all groups, all Christian groups are legitimate churches of the same religion, regardless of their distinguishing labels, beliefs, and practices. What this means is, look, someone that's part of denominationalism, this is what they think, and this is how they, and this is what they believe. They believe that, you know, all, or some, or all, of these different churches you see, these different church groups that we see in the world, you know, they all are legitimate churches of God. They all belong to God. Though, and they are all, you know, um, um, legit, and they all belong to Christianity, amen? And, um, 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 but they all are different from their labels, you know, they have different labels, in other words, they identify themselves different, for example, you know, Catholics are Catholic Christians, you know, look, people that go to the Lutheran um, church are Lutheran Christians, they don't, these are different labels, Methodists are Methodists. Pentecostals are Pentecostalists. Do you understand what I'm saying? Um, Baptists, are, 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 they refer to themselves as Baptists, Christians, and, and so forth. The Jehovah's Witnesses, you know, and so forth. So these are different di labels. And then different beliefs. So all these church, all these different church groups, they believe different from the others. They don't agree with certain, you know, belief systems and certain teachings from these other churches. So they are different. They, they identify themselves with different names. They identify and they believe differently from, from one another and they also practice, you know, differently as far as their worship is concerned. They worship different from the other church. Amen? For example, in, 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 a, in a Pentecostal church, people would probably run around and, you know, and, and dance. But then maybe in a Catholic church, you, you're not allowed to do that. You can only sit, stand up, sing. And do, do you see what I'm saying? And if, it's just different. How they, how, how they, what they practice, you know, and how they, you know, um, believe. In, for example, in the, in the Catholic Church, you probably, you know, may, might be told that you cannot um, eat certain foods, or you, if you are called into a very high office, you should not get married, or something like that. Do you see what I'm saying? And then in another church, it might not be the same. And so, these are different churches. They, they label themselves, the people, or the members in those churches, they, have, they go under different labels. They don't refer to themselves as just Christians. This one would say, I'm a Catholic. Other one would say, I'm a Methodist. Other one would say, I'm a Lutheran, and so forth. And then, 
they believe different about their salvation. You have to do different things. For example, in the Catholic Church, you know, they feel like it's necessary to baptize you as a baby so that your sins will be, you know, cleansed or something like that. That's for your salvation. And then, for example, in the, in, the, in, the, in the Pentecostal church, they'll be like, no, you have to be placed your hands so that they should place hands on you and pray in tongues so that you can start speaking in, you know, tongues with ecstatic, you know, ecstatic um, 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 sounds, if, 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 if we can put it that way, you know, to start speaking in tongues or something. And when you can speak in tongues, they would believe that you have now received the Holy Spirit, you are saved or something like that. And then you would get, for example, in the Lutheran Church, you have to be confirmed. You have to go for the confirmation. You have to learn the Ten Commandments. And then as a, as a, at a certain time or a certain age, you know, you have to be baptized once you, you know, learn the, 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 the you know, um, um, the Ten Commandments. And you have to be confirmed. You know, the confirmation goes up and so forth. And so these are different practices, different beliefs that are going on in these different many churches. And we have at least well over 40,000 different churches that label themselves differently and believe differently and practice differently in the church. And so this is the idea of denominationalism. Now somebody that's part of denominationalism, this is how they think, this is what they think. They believe that all these churches or most of these churches or all these churches, even though they don't agree with each other and even if you don't agree with what they're, what's going on there, you believe that there are other saved Christians in these other denominations and that these people are also going to go to heaven, the same heaven where you are going. It's just that you are, they're taking a different path and you are taking a different path. So in other words, you are headed in different directions, but you're all somehow going to end up in the same heaven, in the same place. And that you are all worshipping and believing different things about God, but you believe that all of you are pleasing to 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 the Lord, to the same God. And um, this idea is something that you have to really, really study. I mean, you have to really, um, how can I say, um, we have to really um, 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 investigate this in the scriptures to see if this is actually biblical or not. Because how can you believe different things about God, preach different gospels from each other, amen, and still say you're pleasing to the Lord the God of the Bible, the one God. So how can you go a different way and end up all in the same place? That's just something that you have to basically learn to see if this makes sense in the Bible. And so when we go to the Bible, we know that there's only one church taught about in the scriptures, which we're going to go through now. Amen? There's the church that we read about in the New Testament of the Bible, and we want to understand what the Bible teaches that they believed and what they were part of. And so about denominationalism, this idea of different churches, divide, this divided churches within Christianity, you know, the Apostle Paul actually talks about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 10 through 13 in the New Living Translation. So we're going to read this, um, we're going to read this through. So the Apostle Paul writes to the church of Christ in Corinth, and he says, I appeal to you, Dear brothers and sisters, by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ, to live in harmony with each other, let there be no divisions in the church. Rather, be of one mind, united in thought and purpose. So, first of all, let's appreciate verse 10. Look at what the Apostle Paul clearly establishes here. First of all, he lets the readers know that what he's now saying, he says, it's by the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. So he's saying this is something that has, by the power, through the power of the Holy Spirit, as an apostle of Jesus, he was now authorized by Jesus. Jesus Christ basically authorized him to write the following in his name. In other words, this message comes directly from Jesus. Do you see what, what he's saying here? So that's how he starts. And he says, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ. So he's saying to the readers, if you have any regard for Jesus, he's saying, then you must take the following very seriously because this is written by the, the authority, Jesus Christ's office, basically. It's coming from his office. Amen? So his office is basically having his ambassadors. And one of his ambassadors 
is, is the apostles. The apostle Paul here who is writing. He's writing on behalf of Jesus. And so he's saying, listen, you know, this following. And what he says, by the authority of Jesus, he says, to live in harmony with each other, then he says, let there be no divisions in the church. So clearly he's talking about one church. And now within that one church, he's saying Jesus Christ, according to this passage, does not authorize any kind of division in the church. That's what the Bible teaches. Amen? So he says, let there be no divisions in the church. Jesus does not authorize this. Number one. And then he says, be, rather be of one mind. United in thought and purpose. That means you must all, you must all be in agreement with the same things. You must all um, um, meditate on the same word. And you must all serve for the same purpose. Amen? And you must all serve for the same purpose. Amen? And he says, nobody should think otherwise. All of us and all of them were basically, they should be for the same purpose. They should, um, um, um. and he's talking about the church here. He's not talking about your, your, your personal lives. He's only talking about the church and church worship and how you live, how you worship God in church. Do you see what you're teaching in your church? He's talking about church, your church life. And it says to the church, there must be no divisions within the church. So he has not authorized different churches to exist. According to this passage, that's why he says the church, one church. Amen? And so that's very interesting. And then he continues... And says, for some of some members of Chloe's household have told me about your quarrels. These are some trusted members. Amen. That the Apostle Paul, by the Holy Spirit, he's trusting these members. And he says, some members of Chloe's household have told me about your quarrels. These are also members of the church there. My dear brothers and sisters. And look at what he says. Very interesting. In verses 12 and 13. He says, some of you are saying, I am a follower of Paul. Others are saying, I follow Apollos, or I follow Peter, or I follow only Christ. And now he gives us a, a, a very editorial a question here, and he says, has Christ been divided into factions? Has Christ been divided now into factions? And we're going to look at what factions, what it means by this very soon. So he says, has Christ been divided into factions? And then he says, was I Paul? Because you say you follow Paul, right? So he's like... Was I, Paul, crucified for you? Were any of you baptized in the name of Paul? And then he gives us the answer and says, of course not. So he says Christ cannot be divided. Why? Because only Jesus Christ died for our sins. And he's, when he says this, he means that only Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen? So basically what he's saying is, look, only Jesus Christ is your Savior. And um, he says, Jesus Christ, according to this passage, you know, has only one church, therefore, because it's only one Lord. So that's why he's saying, has Christ been divided? I mean, how many Jesuses do we have now? That's what he's saying here. And he says, of course not. Jesus cannot be divided. And that's why Jesus said, let there be no divisions in the church. Do you see now how, how this goes together? Do you see? And so now he, we, we will look at verse 12. This is exactly what we have today. He says, some of you are saying, I'm a follower of Paul. Others are saying, I follow Apollos. Apollos was an evangelist. Um, these, um, Paul and Peter, these were apostles. But all of them were basically just serving Christ. They were just preaching Christ by the authority of Christ. And then some are saying, I follow only Christ. In other words, like, okay, I'm not going to follow what the apostles are teaching. I only am going to somehow follow Jesus, and which would be impossible. Because these apostles were speaking on behalf of Jesus. They were Jesus' ambassadors. And the preacher, Apollos, was just preaching what Jesus gave to the apostles. And then he would just take that and preach, just like I would take just the Bible and preach. Do you see now? And that's all they were doing. They were preaching about Jesus and what's true about everything that's true about Jesus. And so the apostle is saying that Jesus does not have more than one church. So do not be divided. Stay in the church of Christ. The, the church that belongs to Jesus. Amen? And so, look at what it says. It says, I'm a follower of Paul. I'm a follower of... Now, um, we know that in Acts chapter 20, verses 28 through 30, um, the Bible predicts of a time when, um, you know, 
um, um, in the last days that, that, that many will fall you know, from the faith and, 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 and people will come from outside into the church to try to teach the church and these will be false teachers. And then it also mentions that some of the, the elders from the church in the first century, that some of the elders, you know, later in the time to come, would now, once the apostles died away, he makes it clear, once the apostles died, you know, some of the elders, elders are the pastors of the church, the leaders, some of the leaders will stand up and start changing the truth. Do you see now? And remember, how does a denomination form? It's when people no longer agree with the teaching. And then they start to want to change certain things about the teaching, and then they move away to start a different church with their different teachings. Now that's exactly what the Apostle Paul, you know, predicts and says would happen. And that's in Acts chapter 20 verses 28 through 30. So that's where he clearly says that some of the elders, the pastors, you know, would basically change some things about the truth and then they would draw a following after them. In other words, they would start, in, you know, you know, having, um, you know, try to win believers to follow them. And then, in other words, he's talking about they would start their own churches and, you know, they would follow these people. And then what would that mean? That would mean, I'm a follower of Paul. Mm -hmm. Another would be like, oh, no, I'm a follower of Peter. Do you see, what, do you see that? And this is the, these, are the, these were the seeds of denominationalism starting to form in the first century, and God condemned it. God was condemning it and said, hey, that's not authorized by Jesus. Amen? But that's what was happening in the church. They were starting to form small groups. And this group was like, no, we follow, we are, we are Paul Christians. These ones were like, we are Peter Christians. No, we are Apollos Christians. And they're like, no, we are Christ Christians only. And stuff like that. And so that's what we see um, within the sixth, the, the third to third to fourth century, you know, we then learn about the, the, this, you know, um, um, the Roman persecution against Christians um, was basically um, came to an end because a new emperor came on the scene, the, the, a Roman emperor in the fourth century. His name was Constantine. And Constantine stops, you know, persecution against Christians because he also wanted to become a believer. And so he now is very impressed with this movement. And so he, 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 he calls for a meeting with, with elders from the Church of Christ. Amen? And so they have a meeting with the Roman government. And at this point, you know, the Roman governor I mean, the, Rome, the Roman emperor wants to endorse and support the church. And so he suggests a little bit of changing in the way the church is organized so that the church can represent the Roman government instead. And in this way, the government can actually help the church to be more effective. Do you see now? And so at that point, some of the elders were like, whoa, wait a minute. Okay, um, and that's called the meeting of, Ni of Nicaea, ne? the meeting of Nicaea. It's called the meeting of Nicaea. So at that point, some of the elders from the, from the, from the churches of Christ were like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. We cannot change the way the church is organized. If the, if, the, if the Holy Spirit, through the scriptures, told us that we cannot, you know, add or remove from God's word. We have to follow only what is, what is in the Bible. And so, but then some elders were like, no, but I think, you know, I mean, it's a, I mean obviously they, 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 they liked the, this emperor. Because, I mean, he's stopping persecution. And so at that point, some of the elders were like, yeah, but I mean, come on, uh, at, least, at least, you know, the, the, the Roman government is not going to persecute Christians anymore, and now they are going to support us, and we might as well just, you know, just change a few things. Why not? And so there came a division for the first time. Amen? And they divided away, because at that time, the apostles were not there. They died. Amen? And so they divided, and so some of the elders went back to the church, you know, to the church... To their, to, their, to their local churches. And then some of the elders had this meeting forward and then they decided, you know, they're gonna actually gonna go with what the, what the emperor is saying, the king. And then they decided that, you know, and then the king suggested that this is how the church, so they, they're gonna start a new church, a new denomination, and this is how it's gonna be changed. Basically, you're gonna have the emperor. That's the emperor, you have the emperor of Rome, that's the king of Rome. And under the emperor, you have, you know, the cardinals. And so they suggested, like, okay, you should choose some one of one of you must basically become, you know, a leader to be to to be ahead of the movement to, you know, on earth. So in other words, that's where the pope came in. So you like you have the Roman emperor, you have the pope, and like you have the um, the, the the advisors to the emperor, you have the cardinals under the pope, and like you have the governors under the advisors 
to the Pope, I mean to the, to the Emperor, you have the governors of Rome, in the same way you will have bishops, and they will be, and then under the bishops you have the local church where the priests would be in the local church. Amen? And so that's how they change, you know, I'll, some other time I'll put up a, a, a sort of like a, a graph or something where you can basically see how, you know, this, how the church was, was changed, the way it's organized. And so you have the emperor, the, the, the advisors, the governors of Rome, and then, and then they changed up and they had the pope, amen, which was Boniface the third. that was the first pope. And then, so you have the Pope, and um, uh, and then you have the, um, um, the, the, the 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 cardinals, and then you have the bishops, and then the local priests. And so this was the structure, and the and then they called this, they gave it a new name, this new church, that, and they're gonna change some things about, you know, the teachings, and so they gave it, you know, the Roman Catholic Church. The word Catholic means in Latin, you know, universal. So this would be the the Roman Universal Church, where all, you know, the, now everybody that's part of this church, now, you know, you have to be a part of this church. Otherwise, you're not, you know, the Roman government will, will you know, you are, you are now basically not um, respecting the government. You are now, you know, you know, it, it was that kind of a thing. And then later on, it was a whole thing of the Church of Christ now being persecuted. And so the Church of Christ went back into hiding. And as a result, you know, they had to hide for centuries because they were being persecuted by the Roman government. And now the Catholic, the Roman Catholic Church became politically powerful. They, they, they were endorsed. They were, they were very strong at that time. And this was called the Dark Ages. They took all the, the books and, and stuff from the common people. And all the libraries and stuff belonged to the, to the church now. And so the church was also controlling the education of the people. Amen. And many people couldn't read in Latin. Because the Bible itself was also translated at that point. And then it took a, a, a monk, um, Martin Luther, who came on the scene around 1570. Um, and so he was basically, um, in the 16th century, he basically came on the scene because he was educated in, in, you know, under the Roman government. You know, he was educated in Germany, a German monk, and now he could read and, 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 and write in, in these in this languages. You know, and so when he studied the, the New Testament carefully, because he was given the, the task to, to teach the new priests. And so at this point, he learned a lot of things in the New Testament, and he realized that a lot of things that the Roman Catholic Church was, was teaching and doing and practicing was not biblical. And so he decided to oppose the, 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 the Roman Catholic Church and say he wants to reform the church, to, to have the church to go back to the Bible. And so this movement is called the Protestant protesting, Protestant Reformation. And this movement, he basically had a trial and he won, and, um, and religious freedom was granted by a new emperor, because this was many years later. And so when religious freedom was granted by the Roman government, that means that you don't have to be part of the Catholic Church, and you don't have to listen to the Catholic Church. Now you can believe whatever, whatever you want, you can be a part of whatever faith, you can be a part of whatever church you want. And so at this point, everybody now started, you know, their own church. They even started a, a church for Martin Luther. Amen? And so somebody even just started, instead of going back to the Bible, they actually started more churches. That, that everybody, if they don't like something, they just, you know, decide, okay, no, we're not going to go with that. We're going to start our own thing. We're going to start our own church. And that's how they started their own church. And that's how Martin Luther's church was also started. And as a result, today, we have at least over 40,000 Christian denominations, 40,000 churches that exist because of that um, religious freedom. Amen? And so, now the, point, now the thing is, when you're in all these churches, now the question is, you look at all these churches and you're like, okay, where do, where do all these churches come from? Because when you read the New Testament, when you read your New Testament, all you're reading about is just one church. And you don't understand how... and why all these churches exist, and why all these churches are so different. You walk into this church, you don't see the same things you see in the other church. And so now you're questioning yourself, you're like, okay, now which is the truth? Which is, where do I, how, how do I worship? Which is the right way to worship? What must I really believe? This church says, this is how you are saved. The other church, no, this is how you are saved. This church says, practice A is, is good. The other church says, no, practice B is good. Practice A is bad. And now it confuses someone. And so we just want to look at what the Bible says. It says, okay, now, which is the true church? 
what were these people part of? Were they also, if you could go back on the day of Pentecost and ask the believers there, um, brother, sister, um, even the apostles, what church, now that you, 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 you've been baptized, now that you believe in Jesus, what church are you part of? Are you, what denomination are you? Are you a Catholic now? Are you a Lutheran? Are you a, what, what denomination are you? What would they answer? Will they say, no, I'm a Catholic? Or would they say, no, I'm a Methodist, I'm a Baptist, I'm a, I'm a Methodist, or I'm a... Would they say that? Or would they say, I don't know what you're talking about? Because none of these churches existed. Only one church. The church that belongs to the Lord Jesus. So they'll just tell you straight up, um, my friend, I just know that I'm a part of the church of Christ. I really don't know what a denomination is. Because there was no division in the church. Amen? And so we basically want to study this. Okay, so today, as a result, you have now the Pope and you know the Catholic Church, for example, those in the Catholic Church today, they say they're Catholic Christians. Today, you see those who are part of the uh, Martin Luther, they are Martin Luther Christians, they are Lutheran Christians. You have those in the, in the, in the, in the Baptist Church, they, are, they, are, they, are, they, are, they go with um, 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 John, um, um, John's Church, and then you go, you get um, the, those in the Jehovah's Witness, they are, they are, they are Russell's um, Church, they're the Jehovah Witnesses. They're following Russell and so forth. So these different church groups, you get those in the Mormon church, they are Mormons, they're following Joseph Smith. And so these are many churches that exist and all of these are different kind of Christians with different beliefs and practices. And so the Bible says, has Christ been divided into churches, into factions? Let's look at what, what he means when he says factions. Okay, now according to the dictionary of faction, is a group of people forming a minority, in other words, a smaller, a minority within a larger body, I'll highlight that. So it's a, it's a, it's a group of people forming a minority within a larger body, especially a dissentious group. Dissentious meaning, you know, um, they disagree and then they start, it's a, diff, it's a, it's a group that disagrees with, some, with, a, with another group. Other de definition of fashion is strife or dissension within a group. So there's division within a group. And as a result, they start a faction. Do you see now? So a faction is a smaller body, in other words, within a larger body. And the larger body in this case would be Christianity. So within Christianity, you have all these smaller bodies or these minorities, which we now refer to as denominations or different churches. Now, the Apostle Paul, when he's saying, has Christ been divided into factions? In the New Living Translation, what he's asking is, has Jesus Christ been divided into different churches? Amen? Has he been divided into different churches? And he says, no. Jesus Christ has not been divided and cannot be divided in different churches. Okay, so why is this? Because there's one rule of faith in the New Testament. And that is in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6 and 17, not to think beyond what is written. Do not go beyond what you can read in the Bible. If you cannot read that in the Bible, this verse is saying, don't think like that. Because now what you're doing is you are leaning on your own understanding, and you are not leaning on God's wisdom. Amen? So don't think beyond, or don't go beyond what is written. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6. And verse 17 says, about denominationalism, for this reason, for what reason? Denominationalism, this, this denominationalism that was started. He says, for this reason, I have sent Timothy to you, who is my beloved and faithful son in the Lord. Here it is, who will remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach everywhere in every church. So in every church, the apostles were teaching the same thing. Nobody was different. Everybody was one in mind, everybody had the same thought, and everybody had the same purpose when it comes to church. There was no different churches because there was no different teachings. That's what this verse is teaching in 1 Corinthians 4 verse 17. As I teach every way in every church. That's why there was only one church in the first century. Amen? And so how do we move from one church to different churches today? Where did that come from? Let's see what the Bible says. Let's, let's look at this teaching. How did this one church in the Bible exist? How does this exist? Acts chapter 2, verse 38, 
verse 41 and verse, verse 47 teach the following. Peter preaches on Pentecost Sunday, the day that the church began, and he says, Then Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's what these people were preached to. That's, that's, the, that's the plan of salvation that these people were given. Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And what happened? And they received, verse 41, then those who gladly received his word, those people who believed the gospel message, were baptized. And that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. So 3,000 souls, 3,000 people believed and were baptized. And the Bible says about these 3,000 souls were added to them. So added to them means added to what? What were they a part of? Okay, let's see what they were a part of in verse 47. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. So these people were added to the church, what these other people were a part of. They were all part of what? The church. Now, does the Bible says, and the Lord added to the churches daily those who were being saved? We don't read that. The Bible clearly says in the New King James, and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. One church. So everybody was added by the Lord Jesus Christ to his church. Amen? So the Lord adds you to the church, and ever since that day, all the saved are added to the church of Christ. Amen? Amen. And so, now, about this, how does the Lord add you to the church? What, what is the church? We want to understand this. Hebrews 12, verse 23, clearly says, To the general assembly and the church and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven. Again, it's talking about one church. It doesn't say in churches of the firstborn. It says in the church, and church of the firstborn, one church, the general assembly, and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven. So you are registered in heaven. How are you registered in heaven? He, um, Revelation 3 verse 5 says, He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life. But I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. So what Jesus is saying is, he's going to add your name to the book of life.